everybody has a skill that they can sell right now. Maybe you're really good at like making blankets and you want to sell them. Like, you know what I mean? There's so many things. So I would just say like gratitude and then focus on what you can actually do every single day to get you closer to your goal. And just realize like you are not stuck as much as it seems like you are and there's no Mm -hmm. other option and you're working around the clock. Maybe that just means you sacrifice an hour of your sleep, which sucks. And like, it's not healthy, but I've been there and I had to do it. You know, that's not going to be everyone's situation, but I do just really believe like, if you don't like your job, change it. It might not happen overnight. You might have kids to feed. You might have, you know, scheduling issues, you might have health issues, whatever, but it is really possible because I did it. And I know I don't have kids and a bunch of these other layers, but I have probably been in situations that others haven't who have not changed their job yet, who have not utilized their skills, who choose not to read or listen to a podcast and would rather watch Netflix, you know, like, Mm. again, there's a time and a place to chill. Rest is always productive when it's needed, but there's also a time to like get off your butt and do something about it. All right, what's up guys? Welcome everyone to another episode of Within. My name is Vince Blaze. Thank you so much for joining us on another episode of our podcast where we uh, we try to tackle as authentically and as, as genuinely uh, mental health topics, self-development topics. Um, so yeah, thank you again. Thanks again for joining us. And as per usual, I've got my co-host Danilo Ilarde with us. What's going on, bro? Hello, how's it going? <laughs> um, yeah, how, you, how, how have you been? I've been good. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of seething rage behind uh, that. Hello, how's it going? Because of all the technical difficulties it took to yeah to get here, but we're here and we're recording, and I'm in a better mood now that we are. So yeah, no kidding. I mean, every time we have a guest, apparently like the whole world shuts down. Oh geez, yeah, it's the most difficult thing to start recording. Yeah. Um, speaking of guests, yeah, speaking of guests, I'm pretty excited. Um, we've got a guest. It's the first time we've recorded a guest in over a year. Yeah, it's been a year. Oh, yeah. That's insane. Um, and yeah, I'm really excited because Danilo and I were, when we were debating what we wanted for on the podcast and we wanted guests and like uh, coffee chats and all that stuff, we we started naming down some of the guests that we wanted to have on the podcast. And this person that we have today is the first person we even thought of. Um, oh. So I'm really excited to have this person onto the podcast. Um, Danilo has a little bit more history with her than I do, um, but we'll get into that today. Um, but without further ado, uh, let's uh, invite our guest today, Taylor Francisco. How's it going? Hello, I'm good. Thank you for having me. How are you? Uh, yeah, we're good. Uh, again, a little triggered from all the audio <laughs> issues that we had coming on, but we're doing great. We're doing great. Yeah. It's okay. It keeps things spicy. True. Mm. True. Keeps things uh, definitely interesting. Keep things spicy. Yeah. No, for real. Yeah. And you know, just to, to kind of round up into what we were the, the topic for today. Um, it, it's funny because Taylor and I don't necessarily have as much of a, I guess, longer, long history as you and Danilo have, because um, you guys are pretty close friends for years. And it's going to be an interesting, whoop, it's going to be an interesting dynamic kind of going through that, because yep. I'm very curious about a lot of your life and what you've kind of accomplished and come gone through. While Danilo also has like the perspective of like, I guess the insider look, the... the yeah, let's call it that. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know if you want to elaborate a little bit on your relationship with Taylor. Well, I mean, like you said, um, it was an easy. She was like one of the first people we decided to have uh, when we were naming uh, potential guests on our podcast. Right. Right. Uh, one of the first people I know that I said <laughs> for sure. Mm-hmm. And again, like a lot of the reason we decided to bring her on and part of the reason that I'm friends with Taylor is because I've watched her like overcome obstacle after obstacle after obstacle. And I thought to myself for this episode in particular, like what could we impart to our audience from my dear friend Taylor? And like, what we could we get her to teach um, our audience? And mm-hmm. a lot of that for, to me was like, what kind of mindset does it take to go, to go through what you've gone through and come out on top every single time? Yeah. So uh, lucky enough today, we're going to be hopefully be sharing some of those insights, some of that journey and some of that reflection today with Taylor. Um, before we get into all of that, how about Taylor, you give us a little bit of an overview of who you are as a person, what do you do right now? What's the, what's the life and what's the kind of status quo? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you for like making me your first guest in over a year and, you know, thinking of me when you were thinking of guests for 2022. That's 
awesome. I'm so happy to be here. Um, but yeah, my name is Taylor Francisco. I'm a social media manager and coach, content creator, podcaster, YouTuber, apparently all of the things. And yeah, kind of <laughs> just rolling with the punches in 2022. I recently had surgery, so I'm just doing everything from home right now, which is why we're not recording together at the moment. But regardless, still happy to be here. Yeah, no, again, super grateful to have you come onto the podcast, even throughout the, the pandemic and the surgery. Um, you know, and and the surgery is funny because it's a little bit more of a, a recent struggle, I guess, that you've you've had to tackle before. But um, one of the reasons we wanted to have you onto the podcast is because, as Danilo was mentioning, he knows a lot about your history and he's seen you grow. And I've just heard kind of tidbits of what, you know, what that looked like, but um, do you want to give us a little bit of an overview of kind of where you came from, what you like, obviously you just gave your, your current status, but you weren't always there. Like it definitely took some work to get here. Uh, when I first met you, you were working a full-time job or a part-time job. Um, so how, like, what's the journey? What's the, the kind of the, the, the whole, I guess, yeah, the journey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So are we talking journey, like since childhood or journey kind of professionally speaking? Um, I think I, I know if uh, there are avid listeners of me and Taylor's podcast, they kind of know the spiel. But I mean, like, uh, I think for a lot of the first time within listeners, uh, hearing the beginning, like where you came from, like for how you went from like the very beginning, like childhood to where you are now, like a thriving independent woman. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Thank you. I think that'd be really interesting. I think that'd be really interesting to go into. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Well, I won't give you my entire life story, but I'll give you like, a nice little overview of a little part of my childhood so you can kind of understand like where I come from. So mm -hmm. I grew up basically with my mom. She's a single mom. We actually lived in a one bedroom apartment. And while I was so spoiled with love, we didn't have a lot of material things. But what I realized like growing up was that a lot of my friends who lived in these big houses and had, you know, all the toys and all these vacations and stuff like, yeah, I looked at it and I was kind of like, you know, it would be nice if we had that. But then a lot of my friends would make comments like, oh, you know, it's so nice that you're close with your mom. And then I realized like, oh, I actually have, you know, something that money can't buy. So I feel like that definitely shaped me. But that's not to say that it wasn't easy looking around and seeing, you know, people have things that I didn't, such as like traveling and a big house and all these different things. So that's kind of where I came from with my childhood. Um, I went to, yeah, like a public high school. I was a dancer. I had lots of friends. Honestly, I had a fun time in high school, so no, I don't really have any complaints there. But during high school, I just kind of always thought to myself, like, okay, I am going to be a teacher because I knew that I loved connecting with people, inspiring people, helping people. And I guess I just didn't really see another way for myself to do that. And I feel like back when I was in high school, so like I graduated in 2013, of course, entrepreneurs existed. Of course, business owners existed, but it wasn't talked about in the same way that it is now. And so I just kind of thought, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to university right after high school. I'm going to become a teacher and that's it because, you know, we're not really taught to explore other areas. We're not taught that it's normal. Mm. Pardon me. Mm, sorry. I'm just agreeing. Yeah. Oh, we're sorry. Not taught that at all. <laughs> yeah. You know, we're not taught that it's like normal to switch your career or that it's okay to want to pursue more than one thing. Right. And so I went to university I really enjoyed it at first, but I was so busy. Um, my mom got hurt when I was around 17 and she wasn't able to work anymore. So then that just put kind of everything on me, like paying for university and all the things, you know, to live. And I was also dancing at the time competitively. So my schedule was super crazy. I was full-time university working basically full-time and also dancing. I have no idea how I did it. I just think I didn't sleep to be honest with you. Um, but even like through all of that, I was still kind of having fun because you know, you're 18, 19 years old, you have all the energy in the world and it's fine. But I had this mindset that I was like, okay, I need to literally work my butt off if I want to make money because that's all I ever saw. Right. And I didn't realize that there were other ways to make money or that it could be easy at that time. And so at some point after, you know, depleting my savings, trying to take care of myself and my mom and trying to, you know, go to university and all the things, I just became burnt out. And at some point I realized like, okay, I am, 
unhappy with what I'm doing. You know, I had this like fancy career as a teacher. I had incredible students and incredible coworkers. Like it had nothing to do with them. I just realized that, okay, this nine to five thing, you know, chasing money, which is hardly even enough for me to live if I'm being honest. Um, and doing this job was not serving me anymore. And so, yeah, I just knew like things had to change. And I think the turning point for me with all of that was that I became so, so unhappy that I was so depressed. I was so anxious. I was in a victim mindset. Even I didn't even touch on this, but like throughout those years of university and teaching, I had been in two car accidents. I had had, you know, multiple dance injuries. So I was just in chronic pain. And at some point, I don't know where it happened, but I just became absolutely miserable. And mm -hmm. every day I would wake up, I would have nothing good to say. I would just be complaining. I would think life is happening to me and not for me. I thought I was trapped. I just felt like there weren't better days coming and that I was just going to be on this hamster wheel for the rest of my life. And so, yeah, in like the deepest parts of my depression, I ended up like trying to take my life because I was just so unhappy in what I was doing. And when I had gotten to the hospital after that incident, they said, you know, if you were here 10 minutes later, you like wouldn't be here anymore. And so I feel like that's where things really changed for me because then I was like, okay, you know, I have to be happy. Happiness starts with me. Something has to change and I can't just blame my environment. You know, like everything that happens in my life happens for me and not to me. And I just had to make the change. So that's kind of the overview on <laughs> before now. Obviously now um, I have my own business. I'm so grateful for what I do. I get to do things like this. And this is like, you know, I get to create content. I get to create podcasts. I get to work with incredible clients and business owners. I get to coach. And so now, you know, I'm using my teaching degree. I'm using all the knowledge that I acquired through all of these other jobs that I have, whether it was you know, serving or teaching or just customer service jobs. Like now I'm really using all of that for what I do now. So I know that was a very quick overview of kind of where I came from and how I got to where I am now. But yeah, I feel like that's kind of the gist of it. I mean, considering that was like the Sparks notes of like your life story. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, it's still incredibly inspiring to hear like uh, regardless. <laughs> um yeah. I mean, first of all, thank you for sharing so openly some of those things. And like, you know, it always catches me off guard how like you kind of just breeze past those <laughs> those moments when you talk about it. Like it's nothing like, yeah. I, I, you know, we could pretty much make a podcast episode out of pretty much any one of those single elements or events. Um, but yeah, like, thanks for sharing that because I think what it does and what we're trying to do obviously today is to highlight that difference because obviously you're at a different place now and like looking back at that, I think that that shows a lot of contrast. And if there's anyone out there who's maybe in that miserable moment or in a similar, you know, kind of depression, anxiety, burnt out situation, um, you know, I hopefully this this can show them that it is possible to get out of it. It is possible to succeed. And regardless of where you come from, um, you can still, you know, achieve great things and you don't have to follow the, the given path like you avoided. Like you mentioned, you kind of thought that you only could do the teaching and now you're teaching, but in a different way. Right. So, again, I think that's super powerful, powerful. And thank you for sharing. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah, thank you. And I wanted to go back to something you said about kind of just like grazing over all of those crazy things. Like, obviously, I'm a little bit further removed. And I always kind of use this analogy of like, you know, when you're going through trauma and grief and these terrible things, it's like you're standing beside this super tall skyscraper. And then as time goes on, you know, the further you move away from the skyscraper, it's still always there, but it's like smaller in the distance. And so that's like where I am mm -hmm. now. So guaranteed, if we had this conversation two years ago, I probably would be crying. So <laughs> I don't want to like downplay the things that I went through. Um, you know, like, there were times that I couldn't focus on exams because I was hungry because I couldn't afford to eat. Or like, even when I was teaching, um, we took our kids to the Christmas cheer board to pack up like Christmas hampers of food and stuff for families. But no one knew that I was actually getting one that year. So, you know, there's there's a lot of things that um, I went through and that everyone has gone through that, you know, it might seem kind of chill now when we're talking about it. But and, you know, that goes for anybody. Right. Like 
anybody that's gone through anything crazy probably can give you the Coles notes on that. But yeah, I mean, for anyone listening who is going through that stuff, it is extremely hard when you're in it. But like Vince said, it does get sure. better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. Sorry, that story about like you bringing it, uh, like food to the the Christmas cheer board, the, the yeah. Christmas cheer board, and then you get sorry, that's crazy. Like shivers, did, man. Yeah. Like, did did <laughs> yeah. you re- like? Did you realize like you just said it was di- it's difficult when you're going through it, but did you realize how difficult your life was like without like feeling sorry or whatever? Like you mentioned the victim mentality, but did you realize your life was difficult or were you just like, oh, this is like, did you? Like, I I guess when you're on the hamster wheel, that's all you can see. Yeah, exactly. You know? Yeah. I mean, I knew it was difficult, but it was just, I was in survival mode. So I don't know if I even had the mm -hmm. time to fully process that. But I remember even like seeing all that food. I was like, oh my gosh, I just want to take all this home with me. Like that was, you know, how bad it was. And I guess during the time, maybe I just didn't have time to process it. Or like Danilo said, I was just on the hamster wheel. So I never really... Yeah, I I don't know if I fully realized how bad it was at the time. Right. Like, yeah, yeah, I guess when your most basic needs aren't being met, like your priority then becomes meeting those needs. Because I mean, like thinking about like how to how to ascend past basic needs into like, am I happy? Um, (laughs) It's hard to really kind of think about being happy when you are thinking too much about being hungry. Right. (laughs) So totally. And I feel like that's where like I wasn't working on my mindset because I was just worried about like, okay, can I eat? Do I have money to pay my bills? Like I didn't realize that I was so negative and that a lot of my life was because of my mindset, but I just couldn't get there because there were other things that were a little more important at that moment. Yeah. And we we kind of talked about it before. It's like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It's like the basic needs are met first and then you can kind of move over to the, to the next step. And the last one is self-actualization. I think. Right. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's, it's cool that we get to kind of see, well, you've been through, I guess, most of them um, through those steps. Um, but w- the, when, when, you, like, when you're struggling and you're, you're going through this, obviously now you're, I guess, a little less. Do you find yourself, like how, how did you start to transition that mentality? Because you often hear the quote, like what made you get here won't get you where you want to go. Um, right? What made you like grow into the person? Because again, you, you mentioned you were in survival mode, hamster wheel. You're doing things on a habit. You're doing things and uh, in order to, to make it to tomorrow. And now, you know, having transitioned a little bit from, from that position to now you're thinking maybe two, three years down the road, you're making business decisions. You're making a little bit of a bolder move. So was there like a moment that kind of helped you or that you noticed was a big impact that transitioned you from that victim mentality, that depression mentality to, okay, I need to start thinking investment. You had mentioned kind of in the hospital when, when that happened, um, that the doctor kind of, you know, mentioned that if you had come in two hours later, that that kind of made it click. But was there anything else, like any other things that you noticed in your life where you like, oh, I have to change or this, this needs to go, or I need more of this kind of thing? Yeah. I think it was just like, after that happened, I had, I think it was like I think I had like six weeks off work. And so I just had a lot of time to be home and reflect on my life and just really think about what I wanted. And I think it was just, yeah, having the time to think, okay, like something needs to change. I want to be happy. I cannot continue living life this way. And I feel like Mm. it wasn't even that I wanted life to end. It was just, I wanted life how it was to stop. So I knew like, okay, you know, this has to start with me and I'm responsible for how I treat people. I'm responsible for the thoughts that go through my head. I'm responsible for what I consume. So the books that I read, the podcasts I listen to, the YouTubers that I watch, you know, even the shows that I watch, I guess at the time I was watching whatever. Um, but you know, I can control all of that. I can control to a degree, you know, what kinds of foods I put in my body, how often I work out all of these types of things. And I was like, okay, I'm just going to take matters into my own hands. Like it was literally just the flip of a switch. And I was like, okay, Mm. you know, this has to change. And there's no reason for me to be unhappy. I'm like, what, 22, 23 years old. I think I was 23 years old. Like that you know, that's so young, like we're still all so young. And I feel like at any age you can have, you know, this moment of self-actualization, but that's really what it was for me. And at that time, I remember being like, okay, I put so much time and effort into this teaching degree. You know, I like, I have this job that so many people are struggling just to get, like, am I absolutely insane for walking away? But then I was like, you know what? 
I don't give a shit. Like, I don't have to ask anyone. I, you know, I don't need to like look for outside validation. I just knew that that was the move for me. And I remember when I told some of my closest friends and well, I told my parents later, but my closest friends, some of them, because they just really wanted to protect me. They're like, I don't know, you know, if that's a good idea. Like, do you really Mm want to leave this stable Mm -hmm. job? And I knew it was coming out of a place of love. But at that moment, when they would say that, and I knew in my soul that I was like disagreeing silently, like I just knew I had to trust myself. And of course I had like Glenn, my my partner, um, he was always super supportive. He was just like, okay, I've seen you go through the worst. Just please do whatever makes you happy. And I will be here. You know, I had some Mm -hmm. friends who were like, just leave the teaching job. It's not worth your life, you know? And so, yeah, I left and Glenn and I ended up moving in together that following um, fall. And when we moved in together, I literally had no job. I was like, I'm just going to figure it out. Like, you know, I'm going to trust myself. I know I can get a job. I've got credentials, whatever. And sure enough, I did. I landed a job, I think a few weeks later at a gym. I was working full time, but even then, you know, I wasn't, I was happy for a bit, but then I just realized, okay, this nine to five thing is not for me. So yeah, I feel like there were several moments where I was like, okay, I need to go off the beaten path. I need to take life into my own hands and stop being a victim because you can stay there forever. Like you really can. It's Mm. very easy to do. It's way easier to be miserable and act like things around you happen to you and you have no control over it than it is to actually take your life into your own hands and say, actually, the kind of day that I have is like up to me. The kind of life that I have is up to me. So yeah, there were several moments. I don't know if I even answered your question. (laughs) No, I I think you did. And I think you also gave a little bit of a insight towards like how you tackle them now or the way you overcome them. Um, I don't know if you want I mean, just a callback to actually one of Taylor's own podcast previous episodes, actually, maybe her most recent one with uh, your guest, Michaela, there. Uh, One of the things I remember her talking about was, uh, and in regards to where Taylor is at right now, Mm -hmm. is you do get to a point in your life where you kind of just go, and pardon my language, but you go, fuck this, essentially, right? Right? Um, And at that point, it's, um, and everybody, I think, has that point where they get there, where they are just like, yeah, F this. But at that point, you either the you either have that moment and then you kind of slink back into like the monotony of like what you're doing, or you actually take it in, like you said, into your own hands and make a change for yourself. Yeah. Right. And I think um given the context of me being Taylor's friend for so long, I've seen her do that several times over and over. And mm. we had originally asked the question like, what was the point at which you did like, you know, made the change and right. started like, you know, becoming the contrast of the two people you are in the past and now. Um, uh, from my perspective, it's just been several of these tiny moments. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, where, <laughs> dude's podcast plug. <laughs> I love it. Uh, <laughs> several of these tiny moments where, you know, you really had to kind of go like, yeah, F this, like, I deserve better. Um, yeah, I, I, I love guess that. what I've seen. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and also if you guys, Taylor, as she, we kind of hinted towards here very beautifully here by uh, <laughs> um, is Taylor is a host of her own podcast called Tiny Moments. So we'll have the link in the bio and everything. You guys should check it out. She shares again authentically. If you want, you guys want to find out a little bit more about her life and a little bit more of the details and her perspective on things, which you guys definitely should. Um, you guys can check it out. Uh, we'll have all the links and everything. For sure. Um, yeah, so I think one of the things that's really important that Danilo touched on and you also mentioned was two things that I think are crucial with mindset that I've discovered personally is accountability and also responsibility to change. Um, and you kind of just mentioned that, that you, you're responsible to make the change. And when you, when you go fuck this and you say this, uh, when you say that to your life and you're like, Hey, no, I don't want this anymore. It's you have, there's only one answer. It's either you accept it and you accept whatever the status quo is, or you actually have to take responsibility and make a change regardless of your situation. Um, so I think that's really powerful and something that Danilo and I have kind of been challenging each other recently on just really, you know, taking accountability for how are you behaving and et cetera. Um, but it, it goes to show a little bit of how you, how you saw and tackle issues or hurdles, um, now and how you can see it. But I'm curious if you can make a little bit of a contrast from your own thought of like, now you can see it a little bit, I guess, more objectively, you know, see that building a little bit further um, and before how you used to see your problems. And just so we can see that contrast of like, what does it take, like the mentality and what what's a bad mentality? What's a bad way to or I guess a less positive, a less um, 
yeah, a less like good way of, of seeing hurdles. And if, if you've seen that contrast, that growth in terms of how you see the, the hurdles in your life. Yeah, for sure. There's definitely a huge difference in how I view things that go on around me. Like before, if something, you know, if someone were to hurt my feelings or do me wrong or whatever the case may be, you know, someone could do that now and it doesn't make what they did any less wrong, but it's just how I interpret it or handle it. So before it was more so like, oh, you know, I can never catch a break or this person hates me or, you know, I did something wrong to deserve this or this is never going to end, you know, oh, my life sucks. Like if something small happened, I would let it consume me for the entire day. And now if someone hurts me, like, yeah, I'm going to be upset. It still hurts. You know, it still sucks that, you know, something hurt me, but I'm like, okay, well, maybe this is a reflection of what's going on with them, you know? I don't think that a lot of people wake up with the intention of being assholes. Can I swear? <laughs> we we I mean, did several times. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. A lot of people don't wake up with the intention of being assholes and hurting people they love, you know? Um, so I really try not to take everything so personally. And also I try and like tell myself, okay, this was a bad five minutes. This is not a bad life. This is not a bad day. This is not a bad week, you know? And I kind of just roll with it that way and decide to move on. If something really pisses me off, I mean, obviously not right now because I can't walk, but I'll go to the gym. I'll go for a walk. Maybe I'll punch my pillow. Honestly, it probably looks so ridiculous and funny, but it helps me like just get the anger out. Maybe I'll drink a huge bottle of lemon water. Maybe I'll go treat myself to Starbucks, pick up a book, journal, like change my environment. Honestly, this sounds so extra, but sometimes I'll just change my outfit and look cute because I'm like, whatever, you know, this is something that I can do to make myself better or feel better and just move on from that moment. I also realized too, that like people aren't really out here intentionally trying to hurt me. Like I highly doubt anybody in my friend circle would ever wake up and be like, you know what? I just want to fuck with Taylor. Like, I just want to make her feel bad today. <laughs> like people don't do that, you know? Um, and if they do, like, those are people you don't want to be friends with. And I've had no problem exactly cutting people. Well, I wouldn't say no problem because obviously it's difficult, but I have like cut people out. I do have a really freaking wholesome circle now that I'm just so blessed to have. Like I could brag about any of my friends for three hours straight <laughs> if anyone mm. would listen to me, but you know, it's all about that, right? You choose who you spend your time with. You choose how you let things affect you. Like I used to get so mad if I got bad service at a restaurant. Now I'm just like, oh, that sucks. <laughs> like your tips probably suck. And that sucks. I used yeah. to be a server, you know, like, I don't know. I just, I don't really let things like that get to me anymore. And so I feel like that would be the biggest mindset shift. But also too, it's like, okay, you know, I had this surgery, which has been so difficult, um, not being able to move since November 9th. It's now February 13th when we're recording this. Like it's been a minute and it's been hard, but you know, I'm not perfect. I definitely have my moments where I'm like, I can't do this. Like I'm over it, you know, but a lot of the time, like I have a morning routine. I wake up, I meditate, I journal, I read because those are things that I can control. And so, yeah, I just, now I just focus on, okay, how can I make myself feel better? And if I can't, like, I'm not here for toxic positivity either. Like we have to feel our feelings. If I need to cry, for 20 minutes, I'm going to cry. If I need to sulk and watch Netflix for an hour, I'm going to do that, but I'm not going to let it consume my entire day. Like, even right. if I really want to feel sad and I want to listen to sad music and just be grumpy all day, like after an hour, I'm like, okay, I'm going to try something to make me feel better. And if I really can't make myself feel better, then maybe I'll like lounge around a bit more. You know, it's all about like listening to my body, but yeah, I think that's the biggest switch is just thinking of how I can make things better or how I view it, if that makes sense. Um, I have an interesting question that I'd kind of like to ask you to contextualize for us, like considering what you've just kind of talked about mindset wise. Um, so I, in my most recent memory, kind of one of the more recent struggles that you've been having that um, you just recently brought up is um, you dealing with your surgery recovery. Right. Uh, and now with your surgery, if you don't mind me talking more about it, like is affecting is directly affecting your leg and your mobility and all that stuff um, and recovery. Um, there are elements of control and non-control that you have in terms of, you know, essentially dealing with that. So, you know, and of course, I imagine there could be a lot of like days where, you know, 
okay, I'm doing a lot better or days where just like the pain really sucks or days where it's just like, okay, I'm not recovering the way I want to. Um, what is your mindset like look like navigating something like that where there's a lot of elements of uh, control and non-control and even to the degree where you can kind of control things, there is like a very limited amount of things that you can actually, you know, control. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I guess my question is like, how do you navigate? How How is your mind navigating dealing with that right now? Yeah. I mean, it's not easy. It hasn't been an easy process the entire time. I do have like pretty easy days, but I do have times where I'm like, okay, I can't go outside. I can't travel. I couldn't really have sex before. I couldn't like, you know, do the things that actually make me feel better, just stretch yoga, like anything. Right. So mm. I feel like the way that I kind of got through it is just to honestly count my blessings. Like that sounds so cliche, but every single day I write a minimum of five things that I am so grateful for past, present or future. Um, it doesn't really matter. I try to hit all three because obviously what exists now is the only thing that's real. Right. But, you know, of course it's nice to like look forward to things. So I think for me, it's just been, okay, how can I count my blessings? Like one throughout my surgery, I have grown my business significantly. Like I'm about to hit my best income goal of my entire business from my couch, you know? So wow. like, that's been a big blessing, just having the time to like really work on it. Um, two, I've had the most support ever. Like my friends, my parents, Glenn, like I seriously, again, could write, like talk about everybody for three hours and how everybody showed up for me, whether it was like bringing me Starbucks or texting me or calling me. I had visitors for the first three weeks every single day. And even now, like I know people are busy and things happen with COVID and we just, you know, got through the holidays and all of that. So I know like me not seeing people as much as normal, but I know for a fact, if I texted any of my friends, they would be here. Either they would call me or they would come hang out. So there's been that, you know, I've had so much extra time with my parents. Like, it's funny because my dad, he's like, he tells me he loves me all the time, but he doesn't. Why are you laughing? It's, it's, I don't know. I just, you know, I just thought, I just thought of a few dear memories of your dad I knew uh, it. that popped, that popped up instantly and nobody needs to know what they are, but like, I'm just, it just popped into my head. So that's, um, that's all I'm going to say about that. I knew that's why you were laughing for anyone listening who doesn't know, which you probably don't. My parents are awesome. They were very much like the cool yeah. parents when I was growing up. Um, and even now, like they come to my birthday parties and get lit with my friends and I. Anyway, this is true. I've had so Let's much go. extra time. <laughs> Vince, you would like my dad. I feel like you guys would be taking yeah. shots together and it would be a whole thing. I but let's go. <laughs> yeah, like my, I've gotten to spend so much more time with my dad. Like there was a few days where he spent like eight plus hours here watching Netflix with me while Glenn was like out and whatever. And that's just not time that I had with my parents or my friends prior right. to surgery. And I feel like going through surgery made me realize like, oh shit, I should probably make more time for the people I love and probably prioritize mm -hmm. joy. And my life isn't any more meaningful because of my productivity. Like rest is also productive. You know, like I, I have learned so much through, throughout this recovery process. And, you know, one of my friends was like, okay, Taylor. And she was dead serious. Uh, she was like, let me know when you're going to you know, be healed because I need to know when I need to start booking my time with you again. Like she was dead serious because before this, mm. I was so busy. I was working from like 7 a.m. to midnight every single day, just trying to grow my business. And I was like, ew, that sucks. Like who wants to book a hangout with me two months in advance? Like, who do I think I am? Absolutely not. So I was like, okay, I'm prioritizing joy. I'm prioritizing spending time with my loved ones. And the fact that I'm doing that, but my business is about to hit the best month ever like that just showed me that I was like okay I actually don't need to work my ass off how I thought you know I need to work smarter and not harder so that's just kind of been where my mindset is at and how I'm like navigating the ups and downs but when I'm down I am down and it's okay and I need to complain and I need to feel the feelings because it does suck like I still can't do so many things. It's going to be another six months probably before I'm like normal. You know, I had a trip planned for March. I wanted to be in LA for four weeks and like meet up with some of my podcast guests that I've had on the show and do all the LA content creator things. And 
that's kind of put on hold right now. So obviously that's tough. You know, it's not all rainbows and sunshine, but at the end of the day, like I would still say, even though those days suck, I've still had so many more blessings and lessons and just growth um, throughout this process than I have had the dark moments, but I have cried a lot. (laughs) Definitely cried a lot, ate a lot of chocolate as comfort, but yeah. (laughs) Damn. Um, I was just like jotting down things as you were talking. So I wouldn't forget him, but like, I hope people who are listening are like noting stuff down as I am, because there's so many gems in like, there's just so many, we won't be able to tackle all of them, but there's so many things that she just shared. Like the the (laughs) fact that like, you know, uh, you're like that. I think that one that caught both our ears was like the, the meaning of life versus being productive. Like, can you find meaning in life versus being productive? And, you know, the fact that you are now hitting bigger goals, which is amazing. Like you're hitting the top of the Thank best you. of your, your business right now. And you're all doing it from home in a situation of crisis. If I can frame it that way, you know, uh, where it's not ideal and you're forced into a situation where you have no backup. Like you have, like, you can't initially go out of your way and, um, and do things that would maybe you would like to do in order to promote your business, but you have to do everything through your, through your computer. And I'm putting words maybe into your mouth here, but I I think it also, it's just powerful because it shows that like, sometimes we just get in our own way. You know, we, we look for, uh, a trigger word for dental distractions. We look for a lot of, a lot lot of things (laughs) just to, to keep our mind occupied and, maybe even in this case, like having to sit down has maybe allowed you to remove those distractions or, you know, hone in on, on some of those things and really face the, the, the real decisions that you want to make. Like you said, you, uh, there's quite a few things that's been happening in your business since then. And, uh, I don't know that that would have happened. Like, I'm confident that you would have pulled it off, um, but I don't know that would have happened as quickly, uh, without that. Um, so it's just kind of a point that I want to, to add on. Cause I think that again, super powerful that like you're you're <laughs> you can see that that growth and that mindset now and and um man i'm going off on a tangent here but there's so many good things you mentioned um, i know right it's, it's it's tough to hone in on just one. Oh, it is so hard like i was just noting things like one of the things i think is also very important and that danilo have all and i have also talked about a lot is being okay with um feeling the pain like being okay with like you said you know, whatever that means to you, um, like going, you said, mentioned going to Starbucks, buying yourself a little something or crying it out, punching a pillow, right? I think, um, I don't remember who said this, but they said like, there's a five minute rule. Whenever something goes bad, terrible, you can just complain about it for five minutes. After that, you move on, right? Um, So yeah, I I just, it's just amazing to listen to that. All those things, those insights. uh, Sorry, I'm just like fangirling here. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you so much. I know, I'm sorry. I should like slow down. I talk a mile a minute and I say so many things at once. (laughs) I I mean, like for me, uh, and because I was when I asked the question in the first place, my biggest takeaway from like uh, asking the initial question is like how you like navigate when things are more or less in and out of your control Mm -hmm. like in that kind of situation my biggest takeaway from that was again um the contrast of one like you know coming everything like it it feels like the key is just taking everything head on whether it be the good things and the bad things but the thing is like yeah taking on everything head on and i think uh what i've learned from you and what i learned from that entire tangent that both of you just went off all was <laughs> was um is the fact that like yeah you have to take the negatives and the positives um and kind of understand what to do with it after right mm-hmm. i think a lot of the male mindset is actually like if there's a negative or if there's something that you don't want to show like where does it go just you know inside yeah, like, right. i know i'm somebody who whether or not i want to um represses a lot and it usually wait until a key moment until it all comes out right um, and that's something I feel like I need to practice a little bit more myself is to be more upfront with what I'm feeling more immediately. So it doesn't kind of just stick in there and fester and wait mm-hmm. until somebody's in the line of fire. And <laughs> I'm not pointing at you, but I mean, you kind of sometimes are in the line <laughs> of fire. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, but yeah, no, like uh, I hope uh, again, like um, if everybody and people, I think people have to just rewind that part just to absorb it all. You know what I mean? But I hope a lot of be, a lot of people will get a lot of key takeaways from that little segment that we just went through. Yeah, and just building off of that, like the the like the fact that you have like you mentioned at the beginning that you've got your routine uh, morning routine. You meditate, journal, um, and just you know take care of yourself overall. And I think that 
like I've been a huge advocate for um, journaling because I think it's the only way that you can really have a meeting with yourself and put pen to paper and really go down and be honest. Mm -hmm. Cause you know, there's always that, that thought that like you can lie to everyone else, but you can't lie to yourself in the back of your head. You always know, like, you know, if you're saying, Oh, I go to the gym. If you say I'm a gym person and you've gone to the gym twice last month, like, you know, <laughs> in the back of your head, you're, you're, you're lying. You're like, you know, yeah. it, and it's hard, but when it's a journal, most of the time, if you keep it private, you don't need to lie. So it removes that pressure and it invites again, authenticity, honesty. And I think that's really crucial. Another thing that Danilo and I kind of talked about in our last podcast is having a neutral party, hopefully a friend, but sometimes even a counselor um, to be able to take off some of that load where you can express it verbally because, you know, writing it down is something, but talking it out to a human being who can reflect that um, and understand and kind of give you empathy, I think is important. Like Danilo has been really um, instrumental to kind of my own personal growth. And probably you can probably uh, relate to that too, Taylor, with Danilo being always clutch. Mm -hmm. And, and being there for us, um, well, me personally, at least. And uh, it's just good because we've developed a relationship where he can give me feedback and I can give him feedback um, without judgment. It's like, you know, we, we can break down things and just know that we're not going to attack each other. We're literally just giving a different perspective. And that way we get to think and grow. And I can also tell Danilo a lot of things that are vulnerable to me, knowing that he's not going to use that against me. So I think, again, journaling in like a neutral party like that is key to... Uh, to growth. I would expand on that and even say that we um, like we have gotten at each other's throats and actually just mm. been <laughs> absolutely like super vulnerable with each other and super upfront and super like vicious at times with each other. But I think the underlying thing and I kind of have this similar relationship with you, Taylor, but just not in the same fashion as Vince. But the fact is you have that trust with that person that mm. like even though I'm like wailing on this guy, like on a psychological level right now, we're still going to be friends at the end of the day. Like, you know what I mean? So, um, well, I think that's why therapy is so important too. Like mm -hmm. I, like I said, I have incredible friends, even my parents, like Glenn, you know, I have an incredible support system, but like therapy was a really crucial part in my healing. And just like Vince said, talking to a human being, because as much as you can journal, like you know, therapists can give you tools and different like mindset tricks that you can use that you probably wouldn't know because obviously they're a trained professional. Like I have a minor in psychology, but to manage my own psyche, like nobody can really do that. So no, for sure. Mm -hmm. The unfortunate thing with therapy is that obviously it's just not super accessible for everybody, depending on where you live. Like I know we have free resources here in Winnipeg where we're located, but I know in a lot of places that's not the case. So, right. you know, I don't want to say this as in like, this is accessible for everybody, but if you can if you have coverage or if you can spare you know whatever the cost is once per month maybe you can only go quarterly but if you can and if your basic needs are met and this is like feasible for you i definitely suggest therapy and the only reason i'm bringing that up is because obviously this is a mental health podcast but yeah. that is like a really big part of my healing is just realizing like oh shit i have these shadows i need to work on you know like right. i mm -hmm. you know i want to be the type of person who walks into a room and like lights it up, which obviously, okay, I know not everyone's going to like me. I'm not everyone's cup of tea and that's fine. I'm really good tea, but some people don't like good tea. So that's fine. But like, <laughs> yeah, you know, I, that's not my thing here. It's just like around the people I love who I know already love and accept me. Like I want them to feel happier after we hang out. I want them to like, feel like it was time well spent, you know? And obviously like, I'm not always happy. So I know like my friends get that and it might not always be a super fun hangout if one of us is going through something. But generally, you know, I want to be that person who makes people feel good because there's nothing worse than like someone walking into a room and you could just feel their negativity, you know, and I feel like that's kind of where I was at when I was so depressed and miserable with my life. And so working with my therapist really helped me to see that and just see where I can make the changes, see how to like cope. Um, you know, when I first started going, it was like, I was constantly in crisis mode. And now actually my last appointment was like probably a month ago. And <laughs> she was like, so what, why are you happy this time? And, you know, it was just very much like, okay, well, this is very much maintenance. Like you're not in crisis mode. Um, and again, this is like, while I'm recovering from surgery. So if I can do it, literally anybody can do it because I was a miserable mofo <laughs> and like, you know, I'm just not anymore. I have my moments, but if I can do it, seriously, anyone can do it. And if you have access to therapy, then I would definitely use it because 
you know, obviously with your friends, you're opinionated, you're a little bit biased, even if you try not to be, you're gonna say things to somewhat protect the other person, no matter what, like, regardless if you're being brutally honest or not. And you know, sometimes we are going to be at each other's throats and a therapist will, if they're a good therapist, they will never do that. (laughs) So yeah, that's just my two cents on therapy. Um, Fun fact, Taylor was the first person who actually got me off my butt and said, hey, like, I know you're going through some stuff. It would be very useful for you to go see a counselor. Like, um, and that was like years ago. uh, And she took me to clinic with a K. Um, Yeah, I will admittedly say that, like, I've been using therapy very sparingly over the years, but I have used it. And I absolutely um, like see like why you should go. And uh, actually, as she said to me all those years ago, going to your therapist should like feel the same as going to your doctor for a checkup because, you know, mental health is just another thing that needs to be checked up just like the rest of your body. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and that was like one val- like super valuable lesson and another kind of like uh, piece of the puzzle to kind of clearing the stigma like behind, you know, dealing and addressing mental health. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, I mean, back, back in the day, like, or I'm actually not that far back in the day, again, like going to your therapist was seen as something that only people who were troubled or people who had like actual mental health issues, um, like would use. But nowadays, again, it should be, again, it is something that like we should be working towards normalizing. And if somebody as successful as Taylor, uh, and as happy as Taylor right now, and it's, it's still using therapy. Like it's not something you should just be doing because you're sad. It's mm. like great to have that checkup, right? right? The same, like people still go and get physicals from their doctors, even though they're relatively healthy, just so they have those check marks, like, or those, um, yeah, those check stops yeah. um, over the course of their lives. So, yeah. And just to add on to that, like, I think again, with journaling, it's good because you're accepting it's that acknowledgement part. Yeah. But when you've got an external input, it's someone who can see the whole picture from less of a bias answer or perspective sorry less of a biased perspective and really point out some of the things that are like you know maybe hindering or like you know like just like kind of like athletic therapists or or doctors or physiotherapists can be like oh you're you're hinging a lot like on your right hip and this is causing a lot of back pain etc or um you know if uh my sister's boyfriend he's good with cars and he's like oh yeah there's too much tread that's being they're not the tread is is being worn out d- at different amounts on each tire, which I don't know how you noticed that, but he <laughs> noticed it. And it's like, because the the framing or the axis wasn't proper on the, the, the cars, right? So small little things from someone who's got a expertise and like a kind of that external view, I think that's where a therapist or a counselor can really come, uh, can provide a lot of knowledge and insight. And I think, like you mentioned, the, the more of the, when you're happy, you know, a lot of people, when, they, when they're good, they stop going to therapy. And it's, I think it less of being a, because therapy, in my opinion, should also not just be a reactive process, but a proactive process, mm, right? Exactly. When you're, exactly. Yeah. When link, things are going well, make sure you've got everything in your corner that are keeping you well, right? Because you want to stay in that high as possible. And you also want to prevent some of the bad things to happen. So, you know, a therapist again, or a counselor could potentially just spot some of those mindsets that might be turning into something that could snowball into a terrible, you know, uh, situation, right? So I agree. I'm I'm seeing a counselor myself. Hopefully we'll have her onto the podcast at some point. She agreed to it. So um that'll be a cool episode. But I love that you're you're doing that and that you're so pro about that because I think it's it's instrumental to um self growth, if I can put it that way. Yeah. And uh, I love what you said about like, you know, the car guy seeing the thing with the tire. I don't even know mm-hmm. what you said, but you know, the thing with the tires or your athletic therapist saying, oh, actually, you know, you're leaning a lot on your right side or whatever it is. Like mm-hmm. that is just so proof that we can think everything is all good, but there's always room for growth. Like hundred percent. even now with therapy, I'm like, okay, I'm so happy. Like, how can I be happier? Or like, how can I be more mindful when I'm meditating and not let my mind wander? What are some exercises I can use when someone pisses me off? Or just like, you know, it's just really maintenance. And like Vince said too, like, you know, you don't want a situation where it's always reactive because that's not really the most productive for you. You don't want to be in crisis mode every single time because you're already there. You know, you want to prevent going there in a healthy way. You know, obviously again, feel your feelings and all the things, but if you can stop yourself from spiraling into like the deepest depths of despair, you know, it's probably, probably going to be helpful. Yeah. And I absolutely love that. Cause I think one of the things that's, that you shared and that's key is 
again, having an expert or someone there to guide you. And one of the things I wanted to ask you, and this is just uh, personal curiosity, but like, did you ever have like a mentor? Did you ever have, like, obviously you had your, you said your parents were really wonderful. Glenn was there supportive and Glenn's her boyfriend, by the way, I don't know if you mentioned it, um, you know, her friends, et cetera. And there's a whole other topic, which we won't necessarily get into, but like the, your friend circle, your immediate environment, right. You know, you're the average of the five people you hang out with kind of thing. Um, so there's all that, but was there like people that you think that were really, I guess, again, instrumental to the way that you shaped your outlook on life or how you grew or et cetera? Yeah. I mean, in terms of mentor, like professionally in my business, I wouldn't say that I had one. I had one for a brief moment, which is actually my old business partner who I'm no longer partnered with. That was very brief, but very mm -hmm. necessary to my growth. Like he knew a lot more about the business side of things. He had like kind of a bigger perspective than I did. And I don't mean that in like, I'm a very ambitious and motivated person, but in terms of business, like there was just a lot of things that he kind of pointed out that I could do to make my business even bigger. So I'm definitely thankful for that, but it was very fleeting, short-lived, kind of done with that. Thankful for the chapter, but yeah, I would say professionally, honestly, I haven't really had a mentor. Like I'm kind of like, even when it came to YouTube here in the city, like there were a few people who told me, you know, you were like one of the first women that I watched here doing it. And even in terms of like having a social media agency, like none of my friends are really doing what I'm doing. They all have um, very different jobs than I do. So I wouldn't say that I really had a mentor like professionally. Um, I guess though, you could say like the people that I look up to kind of in the industry or who are like doing what I'm doing, I would say are like the people who make podcasts that I listen to, the YouTubers that I grew up watching, you know, the content creators that I see online that really inspire me. And I'm not talking like just the hot Instagram models because we all see those and they're great and whatever. But these are people who are like really embodying what it means to me to like be successful and be happy and like truly pave your own lane and like you know, do what you want to do. So I would say those would kind of be like my mentors. I wouldn't say I had someone personally close to me in terms of like profession. I think all three of us actually echo that sentiment. Like mm -hmm. Very um, much so. I always say that I've had a mentor, like kind of like when I first started getting into music, but I realized also in a similar fashion to Taylor, like that was a super fleeting experience. Like um, mm -hmm. the guy was in my life for all of the first two months that I started making music, but he technically taught me nothing he taught me mindset like mm -hmm. that's what he taught me <laughs> uh like but in terms of yeah. technical skill he actually imparted nothing to me um he just mm -hmm. gave me a couple key words that really changed the direction in which i like took my music or the direction that i decided i wanted to take my music right but again fleeting experience he didn't really stick around for that long uh and then up until then like um up until yeah up until then like pretty much everything was just you know, again, being inspired by what I had found, um, doing the things that I already liked doing, but I didn't actually have anybody directly intervening and shaping like the way, the way I was taking my own career and all that stuff. So it's kind of interesting. And I'm pretty sure you're the same way, right? Vince or? I mean, I think, yeah, I, I haven't had necessarily, well, it's funny because I have a lot of different aspects of it. I did judo for years. So I had a coach, uh, different coaches throughout my judo career um, as an athlete, uh, as a high performance athlete. So I had coaches there that would tell me, you know, okay, like, you know, they would literally watch me fight and practice all the time. So they knew who I was and knew where I ate, you know, like they knew exactly everything. Uh, you have a personal trainer, you have a nutritionist. Um, I had a sports psychologist, you know, you have, to, I had, I've had that experience where I've had some, so many people like involved with the process. That being said, the one thing I regret the most out of my entire judo career was that I didn't allow myself to take decisions on my own. Like I remember decisively the year that I did the best was when I would never look at my coach mm -hmm. on the mat because I didn't look for the answer. I figured out the answer on the spot. And, mm. um, obviously from time to time, it's nice to just have someone he's like, they can see, again, they can see the outside picture and be like, you know, like aim for the right foot aim for the right foot, like push on the right foot, you know, or they can tell you stuff, but internally, if you don't have the answer and you don't have that, that I can put it even in sport, the genuine curiosity to find the answer, the fix or whatever, you're not, like an external pressure is literally you just, you'd be dependent on someone else. And you literally just answered like in my question originally, I thought to myself like, you know, what's the difference between somebody who's a coach versus somebody who's a mentor? And uh, I just came to the conclusion based on what you just said is that 
mentors for us are actually chosen. Like we choose our mentors. Like mm. I don't think mentors come up to me, come up to you and be like, I'm going to be your mentor because you have to look towards the person that you want to be like or be inspired by and then, you know, kind of obtain their wisdom and their teachings that way versus somebody who's like a drill sergeant and just tells you like, you know, this, this and that, right? Yeah. But I mean, coaches can also, and like Taylor's literally a coach, right? So <laughs> true. Like, we're like, not to take away anything from coaches, coaches don't necessarily like um, they don't necessarily drill anything in you. There's good coaches, bad coaches, et cetera, and different types of coaches is like, you know, like Taylor does, which is a little bit more on, on the, the business, business and social media side of things. Um, while mine was like very physical in terms of like training, um, which, um, I'm not going to say that the competition is higher because business is higher, but there's, there's a lot more of like a at stake in terms of like the moment and whatever. Actually, geez, like, I guess going by that definition, technically Taylor is sort of a mentor to me on like the, yeah. on, on the social media business side, at least like, <laughs> which is kind of funny to think about, like now, now that we're talking about it. Um, yeah. Yeah. And it's not wrong to say that you can have a coach who is also your mentor, but I think like, again, strictly speaking, the actual definition of a mentor is somebody that you choose yourself. I think a mentor can also be someone that doesn't even know that they're a mentor. Just like yeah. you mentioned, like Taylor, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. like, no. I look up to a lot of content creators and I'm like, I want to be like that person. And that is an inspiration, but it's also like a mentor because I can see the way they live their life, the way they put themselves out there. And to me, that's like indirect mentorship. It's just osmosis. <laughs> osmosis. Osmosis. <laughs> yeah. Well, was, fair enough. I mean, that's a whole other debate. I think that there's like social media is great for what it does. It's also negative. But I think that like I try to take as much positivity from it just from the way that other people carry themselves. Um, but I think also to kind of segue into the next question, I think one of the biggest things that mentors and coaches both allow to tackle is the men men mental aspect of it. Like you mentioned, um, the, the mentors are usually there just to help you with the mentality that you need to be able to challenge, um, some of the hurdles that you are coming in. And I'm sure that you see that with some of your clients, Taylor. Um, but in your experience as a coach, but also as an individual, um, one of the questions Daniel and I bounce back and forth is what is most difficult to handle a physical hurdle? Like for example, a surgery where it inhibits you from moving or an emotional hurdle. Um, or like a physical hurdle could be like lack of money. Um, it could be a or lack of energy or physical energy. energy exactly. Like, like anything day. that's like, like yeah. tangible, but like an emotional hurdle is more like, oh, I can't get over this person kind of thing. Or, um, I, you know, victim mentality or depression or, um, yeah. So I, we're kind of curious to see what your thoughts, cause you're experiencing both or you experienced both, I guess. Um, so yeah, yeah. What are your thoughts on that? don't think that you can really say which one is harder to be honest with you because I feel like they go hand in hand so like for example I know for sure that if I ate McDonald's every day and I just ate till I was sickly full I actually used to do that in high school um you know I probably wouldn't be feeling too great mentally I probably wouldn't physically feel great I'd probably be bloated I'd probably like not have the greatest energy so there's that but then also on the mindset side of things like if I choose to wake up every day and focus on how much my back hurts and focus on how much my leg hurts then physically I'm also going to feel that more so I know mm. this is like such an annoying way to answer your question but it's like <laughs> they both really go hand in hand, you know, how you think about your pain and how you think about even, you know, your recovery. Um, or even, you know, you hear of people get in these like terrible accidents who end up not being able to walk, you know, you have some people who, and you know, whatever they feel is valid, I can't even imagine. But you know, you have some people who they just get really depressed, and they they lose their motivation, then you have some people who end up like, becoming super buff in the gym with their upper body and like doing all these crazy things. So I think that it just, it really goes hand in hand and I can't really say which one is worse than the other. I know that's really mm. annoying, but yeah. <laughs> no. And that's, that's, again, it's, it's very honest. And I think they, like you said, they go hand in hand. One brings on the other, usually in some way, you know, if you have a physical hurdle, it makes your mental uh, balance not as healthy. And if you have a mental hurdle, you, tend to do bad behaviors like go eat mcdonald's right so i think they do go ahead and i mean it's also subjective in the way that like uh sometimes a physical hurdle might not affect you the same way it does the person next to sure. you sure yeah and the same same goes for the emotional too yeah um i guess i guess i guess the the short answer is like yeah i agree they're incomparable but they're also comparable at the same time like um you can contrast between how one affects you without like you know um 
involving the other, but you mm-hmm. can also make the comparison as well if you need to. Um, I think it all they, at the end of the day, they all just go into the category of how hurdles in general kind of like will affect you. And I guess that is subjective, like across from person to person to person. Um, but I mean, it is interesting to even ask the questions to, to right. actually have those contrasts and comparisons even brought forth. Like when you think about it, it just to come to the realization that like, yeah, they are kind of hand in hand. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And like you said, it's subjective. Like one person may find it more difficult to overcome some physical hurdles because they're already mentally they're perhaps they're go, go, go. But as soon as something physical comes in their way, they kind of shut down or whatever or the other way around. Right. right. Um so it's just again, I'm I'm glad that you gave your answer, um, regardless of <laughs> uh, the outcome. But um, <laughs> okay, <laughs> the shade. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think it also I think it, it comes down to the the aspect of like having the proper mindset just overall and the outlook on life. And you mentioned a lot of the things that help with your outlook, like gratitude, um, you know, uh, past, present, and future. Um, there's, there's, I think a lot of things that help shape, uh, the way that we outlook on life, but with having everything that we've kind of discussed in your experience in life, is there any, like, I don't know, maybe recommendations that you would have for someone who might be in a darker spot, um, who might be at the beginning, um, you know, um, that, who that might be on the hamster wheel. Yeah. Might be on the hamster wheel might be, you know, in the process between, you know, going from rags to riches or, you know, going from, from wherever their situation and they know that they can do better, or maybe they can't even see it. Right. Maybe they're again on their hamster wheel and they can't see it. Is there anything that you would like, like to share to those people that you think that would, would have helped you maybe in that moment? Yeah, I definitely think start always with gratitude, like really start with gratitude and say, okay, I'm thankful for a roof over my head. I'm thankful to have friends who love me. I'm thankful that both of my parents are alive. I'm thankful that I ate breakfast this morning. Like you really have to just look at what you have because there's so much that you could focus on that's negative, but like really hone in on what is it that I'm thankful for? Maybe you're just able-bodied and like you don't have to go to athletic therapy like I do once a week. Maybe that's what you're thankful for and that's it. Or maybe you have really good hair and you're thankful for your hair, like whatever it is, (laughs) because I am, I mean, you know, but you know, whatever it is, just focus on like the good. And then I think the next step is just literally like, okay, what has to change? Like, you are never really stuck. Like it's, it's such an illusion. And I know that this is like, I feel like I don't want to sound ignorant because I understand, like, I understand what it's like to struggle to make ends meet, to barely pay the bills, to go out for a dinner and wonder like, shit, did I just spend my phone bill money? Like, I know how that's like, you know, and I understand there's single parents out there. I understand that there's people with disabilities, with mental health issues. There's so many layers and I get that, but like, what can you actually do right now to change? So maybe you can wake up five minutes earlier to do a three minute meditation. Maybe you can start a blog. Maybe you can become a virtual assistant because you're really fast at typing and you can market your services that way. Maybe you can go on Indeed and become a product tester part-time on the side to make some extra cash. You know, maybe you can go to school again. Maybe you can, if you really want to be a social media manager, you could you know, listen to podcasts, you could invest a little bit in a course if you have the means to do that. Like, just think of what can I do today to get me closer to my goals? Like if what you're doing throughout the day, if there's nothing that's getting you closer to your goal, let's say you want to make more money. If you're not applying for other jobs, if you're not looking, if you're not thinking of how you can utilize your current skills right now to sell something for someone right now. And again, that could be babysitting, that could be admin work, that could be a virtual assistant, you know, doing whatever, right. like you, everybody has a skill that they can sell right now. Maybe you're really good at like making blankets and you want to sell them. Like, you know what I mean? There's so many things. So I would just say like gratitude and then focus on what you can actually do every single day to get you closer to your goal. And just realize like you are not stuck as much as it seems like you are, and there's no other mm. option and you're working around the clock. Maybe that just means you sacrifice an hour of your sleep, which sucks. And like, it's not healthy, but I've been there and I had to do it. You know, that's not going to be everyone's situation, but I do just really believe like, if you don't like your job, change it. It might not happen overnight. 
you might have kids to feed, you might have, you know, scheduling issues, you might have health issues, whatever, but it is really possible because I did it. And I know I don't have kids and a bunch of these other layers, but I have probably been in situations that others haven't who have not changed their job yet, who have not utilized their skills, who choose not to read or listen to a podcast and would rather watch Netflix, you know, like, Mm. again, there's a time and a place to chill. Rest is always productive when it's needed, but there's also a time to like get off your butt and do something about it. You know, like Mm -hmm. if I cried about my teaching job for three years and didn't change my job, like who can actually feel bad for me? You know, did I look to find another career? Did I do anything? So I would say that's like my best piece of advice. And then just be mindful of like, what you're consuming, you know, what kind of books are you reading? Mm. What kind of shows are you watching? Are you wasting your time watching Netflix when you could be doing this free course? There are so many creators who run free live trainings when they're prepping to um, do a campaign for their course that they're releasing. I have learned so much in free trainings that I haven't paid for. I mean, obviously I've invested in things because I'm a coach and I'm a business owner, so I'm constantly learning. But before I had the money to do that, I was just looking for all the free resources that I could compiling them in a way that made sense for me. So like, yeah, those would be my three pieces of advice. So again, one would just be, um, gratitude Two, what can you do right now to change it? And then three, like, what can you consume? That's going to make you feel better. So that's books, TV shows, um, Jeez. podcasts, all the things there's a lot more, but I would say those are my like top three. Um, what I love the most about this advice, cause you originally asked, um, you know, how advice for somebody who's stuck on the hamster wheel, who was dealing with dark times. But what you just said is applicable to you wherever you are in life, past, present, future, uh, whether or not you're struggling, whether or not you're surviving, whether or not you're thriving, applicable in any situation, which is fantastic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yeah. you kind of hinted towards like growth is just never ends. You said like you're always learning, you're always reinvesting in yourself. Um, but I think all, another thing that I just kind of want to pick out of that is you like a lot of what you said, like the, the, like go, uh, sorry, look into getting a job, uh, look into, you know, putting your resume, et cetera. These are small things like three minute meditation, you know, they're not huge. And I think that personally, like, a lot of, a lot of the change starts with momentum and it builds with momentum. And how do you build momentum is small things. It's small things adding up kind of, uh, like we hinted earlier, tiny moments that shape <laughs> the big picture. Right. Um, and you know, that that's a whole other topic that I think we hopefully will tackle next time you're on the podcast. Cause we'd love to have you on again. Cause I don't know, personally, I think I'd this is amazing. We just yeah. chip the, just the chip, the piece or the tip of the iceberg. Tip this of one, the iceberg. Think, yeah. Yeah. Really feel like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately we have to wrap up the podcast cause uh, you know, we, we could talk for hours and uh, I'm sure we, we <laughs> will go off onto many tangents, but again, I hope anyone who's listening to the podcast right now, um, enjoyed this. I hope you guys have pulled a lot of insights because again, this is someone who is the living proof of someone who has gone from such a dark place in their life, a very, uh, I don't want to say poor, but like a very not, um, not positive environment, like a very, I'm lacking the words here. Help me. To the- <laughs> uh, I was just going to say somebody who, somebody who took the worst of situations and made yeah. it to the best of situations, I'd say. Yeah. Living proof. Let's just exactly. Say, let's go with that. One of the things that's funny, I always look at like, you know, you look at the big celebrities, you know, like, and when they tell their story and you're like, ah, there's no way that they were there. But, you know, we literally have the proof in front of us that, they, you know, it is possible to, to make it from, from, from zero to a hundred, if I can put it that way. <laughs> um, but yeah, again, it was amazing to hear your story. Thank you so much, Taylor, for joining us. Um, again, hopefully we'll have you on the podcast again. It was awesome. Hopefully without the technical issues that we had this time around. Um, right. Oh, um, where yeah, can people me. find you? Yeah, good question. And yeah, yes. where can people find you? Well, thank you so much for having me on. I will definitely come back if you want to have me. And you can find me on taylorfrancisco.com. That's where you're, you'll find everything um, you need to know about my business. Hit me up on Instagram, though, because that's where I hang out the most. So at Taylor Francisco, that's at T-A-Y-L-E-R-F-R-A-N-C-I-S-C-O. And then, of course, you can find the Tiny Moments podcast on all streaming platforms. I usually hang out on Spotify, but whatever your cup of tea is. And yeah, I would love to connect with you. Send me a message if you listen to this podcast episode, because I would love to just hear what you thought. Mm. Yeah, right on. Yeah, exactly. Uh, all the links will be in the description. Again, um, if you guys were interested in a topic like Taylor kind of mentioned, feel free to send us a DM, uh, all of us or the podcast or Taylor herself, or even if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, feel free to drop a comment. Let us know what your thoughts are. 
uh, what was your favorite uh, takeaway from the entire podcast? Because there's a lot of them. Uh, I was trying to note down some of them as we were going. <laughs> Definitely couldn't keep up. Um, so yeah, again, thank you so much, Taylor, Taylor for sharing so openly your experience. Um, uh, I really think that this one's going to, a lot of people are going to relate to this. So uh, I think the mission is accomplished for this podcast. Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you. All right, if you guys aren't already subscribed to the channel on YouTube, please do so. You can follow us again on Instagram and we're also on Spotify and all the listening platforms as well. Um, yeah, hopefully you guys enjoyed. Thank you again for listening. And uh, as a celebratory end finish, we usually do. We should have told you this, Taylor, but we usually... Uh, we should have had her have a cup. Oh, did she? Oh, oh, yeah. Hey. We're, we're <laughs> going to cheers and do a virtual cheers. cheers. And uh, we'll see you guys next time. Thanks so much. See you later, guys. Take cheers. care.